right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our weekly Thursday webinar at 12 o'clock. The Noonday Gun has just gone off in our Cape Town studio, and we're really thrilled to kick off yet another insightful webinar session. I'm Neil Peterson. I'm the founder and content-in-chief of Real Estate Investor, South Africa's premier independent real estate content education and news platform since 2007. And at REI, we're really passionate about serving the South African real estate investor, the real estate industry and property business community through our online digital platform, REI.co.za, our monthly digital magazine, Real Estate Investor, and REI's webinars and our in-person seminars and conferences. So today I have the pleasure of serving as your host and moderator for this investment webinar. And we're really thrilled to have you to join us for this insightful session. So today's topic is strategic UK property investing, what South African investors need to know. And we're doing it along with Sable International, International Property Investment Simplified. And before I introduce you to our two international real estate expert panelists and delve into our discussion for some housekeeping. So I extend a warm invitation to our new guests and faithful attendees to actively engage with us during this webinar. Your participation enriches our dialogue. So please feel free to ask any questions you may have for our panelists. To ask a question, please utilize the designated Q&A box located on the bottom right-hand side of your screen, not the chat box. That's for general comments. So rest assured, all of your questions will be addressed during the Q&A panel discussion. Uh, there will be three poll questions, and that would probably be pop up on your screen now. And if you could probably just complete those three poll questions, you can see over there how important is location to you when choosing an investment property in the UK, uh, what type of property you're most interested in, if you could answer that one, and how familiar are you with the UK uh, property market. So yes, your input is very important. And uh, so obviously we'd like to get as much information as, as we can from you uh, on that. Okay, so recordings, we get this question a lot. It will be accessible uh, post event via email if you've registered for this webinar. And for those who have not registered, Recordings are accessible via the rei.co.za website under events on the homepage. So without further ado, let's move to the heart of today's webinar, Strategic UK Property Investing. So today we'll explore investing in offshore property in the UK. It's a market which is well-renowned for its health returns and stable economy. And we'll also discover the most promising property investment opportunities plus unravel all the things that you need to know and equip yourself to invest into the UK property market. So without further ado, please let me introduce you to our esteemed guest panelists today. First of all, uh, our first guest panelist is uh, Richard Haller. He is the Managing Director of Sable International Offshore Real Estate and Investment. Richard, will you please introduce yourself uh, to the audience today, please? Hi, good afternoon, Neil. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm from Sable International. I manage the um, real estate and investment migration division at Sable. So we really specialize in helping our clients uh, with two solutions. One is global mobility. So um, helping them find avenues to move around the world easier. So that is through residency by investment, citizenship by investment. Um, those are the main platforms. Um, and then the other side of it is how do we help our clients migrate um, assets into hard currency? And that's obviously through the real estate angle. So uh, obviously the UK is a big one and we have a few other jurisdictions that we can touch on a bit later. Wonderful. Great stuff. Great having you again, uh, Richard. Uh, Megan, our second guest, Megan Copley. She's the sales director of Sable International Offshore Real Estate Investment Migration. Megan, will you introduce yourself to the audience, please? Thank you, Neil. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Megan Copley. Um, I have a long career in um, specifically property investment, more recently with Sable in the last three years, property investment, which also offers a second residency 
citizenship. But um, most importantly, my role is making sure that the property that you buy is underpinned by the fundamentals that make it a qualifying property investment. Wonderful. Great having you, Megan. Wonderful. I think it's going to be a very interesting discussion today. So Richard, let's maybe just start off with you. Maybe just introduce us a little bit more to Sable, the different international markets, you know, why investors should look at international property. I mean, today we are UK focused, but maybe just as an intro, maybe just compare different markets and some of your key services. Sure. So Sable International's um, sort of core business is really looking at assisting our clients with cross-border transactions. So that's ultimately when a person is in one jurisdiction and potentially their asset is in another jurisdiction. Um, and within Sable International, we have 14 different divisions um, that covers everything from uh, Forex to moving money out of the country uh, to investment migration. So the residency and citizenship programs, uh, offshore real estate um, and where to invest in. Um, and then also a number of other businesses um, in terms of study abroad, um, getting the kids to study abroad in universities, um, and then uh, tax business, wealth business, and you know a couple of others. So that's really the, the background of Sable International. Um, in terms of the, the, the real estate jurisdictions, um, apart from the UK, which has always been a stronghold for South African investors, um, we have got um, property in Greece, as an example, which is underpinned by a golden visa. So um, Megan's job and my job is to make sure that that property in Greece um, is a sound investment and it's not just a vehicle to get a golden visa. So both need to stack up. Uh, Mauritius is a popular one. Uh, we've just launched our office in Mauritius. Um, and that's always been a mainstay for South Africans looking for something close to home. Um, and then we've got uh, Switzerland, very interesting jurisdiction, some interesting 5% um, guaranteed yield product in Switzerland, um, and you know a few other sort of jurisdictions we look at where we see value and where we see benefit to the clients. Excellent. Great. Thanks for that little summary. Today, we're talking UK properties. So Megan, let's, let's start unpacking this. And there's quite a lot of things to unpack today. Why should people, first of all, invest in property and particularly in the UK? I mean, the UK... Um, has been a compelling destination for investors. I mean, how does its market stability and historic performance contribute to its attractiveness? Thanks. Um, thanks, Neil. What I'm going to do is I've just pulled up a presentation. I think um, in order to answer these, I've got some key points um, on the right. presentation. We can all see it, Megan, just so yeah. that you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good. <to>. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I... Um, I'm happy. I'll answer all the questions that, that Neil asks um, just to run you through how we work as well as I go. Um, so we're a bespoke advisory service um, looking for property investment to suit our clients. Um, and as Neil's your question now is why UK property? Um, I think it's, it's going back to the simple fundamentals of property investment. Um, why property? Why UK property? Um, I mean, UK is one of the strongest and most invested markets in the world. Um, you know, that's really important when understanding why other people invest in a market and why it's got a strong demand, no restriction on foreign investment. And it's obviously very popular with other investors, which um, that, that trend should, you know, set an example anyway. Um, the UK is a powerhouse of commerce and employment. And these are very important important factors when considering offshore property investment. You need tenants who can earn money, who can find jobs and who can pay the bills and pay their rent. You know, that's that's just a very, very simple analysis. Um, a booming rental market and annual growth. Um, more recently, interest rates have been on the rise in the UK. Um, what stabilizes the market and what makes it such a robust market has been the rental increases that we've seen during times of high inflation and high interest rates. It, it suggests a, a great demand for property, a lot of people who need to be housed. And during times of high interest rates and high inflation, people are less likely to buy property. So therefore, we saw a nice increase in rental demand. So that's a, that's a, a sign of a very, very robust property market. Um, and then low interest rates in the UK um, have always driven an increase in purchasing power. So again, a market that works in high and low inflation times is a, is a good, robust market for an investor. 
Okay, great. So maybe mm. just uh, let, let's start looking at the sort of the top UK property hotspots. I mean, it's, uh, it can be a minefield for some people coming into the market for the first time. You know, maybe let's unpack what are the regions, where are the cities that's showing the most pro promise for investors? I mean, everybody, when yeah. they think of UK property, they tend to think of London. It starts in London and it ends in London. But it's, yeah. uh, it's, far, it's far more complex than that, isn't it, Megan? Yeah, exactly. Um, funnily enough, in the UK, what you get um, in property value in London is, is a lot less than what you'll get in property value in, say, the north of England. That's obvious given demand, given you know a transient community, people moving through London, job opportunities in London, pay in London, you know, it's, it's well known that you get you get sort of a super pay if you work in London, whereas if you work in an office of the same company in another part of the UK, you'll you'll earn less than that of your, your London co-workers. So, um, sure, London's property market represents a very, very high value market, but generally quite a low rental yield market. So, whilst you'll always have booming demand, you know, a flurry of people looking to purchase property, owner, occupier, and investor in London, you might not see the nice high percentage yield on a rental property in London that you'll see in other parts of the country. So I think depending, again, it's there's loads of booming parts of the UK, specifically in the north at the moment. You know, there's, there's a regeneration scheme, there's a movement or a movement of workers to the north, to Birmingham, to Manchester, to surrounds, which is driving the um, the demand for property, and therefore with a low supply, high rental demand, and high demand to purchase property in the north. So we're seeing fast growth. Um, you know that's that's a good opportunity for investors, say, to get in for the short term and to get out with fast growth and see, you know, maybe an upside on their wealth. But but property for me has always been a long-term asset if a generational asset so you know one should be should consider many parts of the UK for many different reasons and again what they're looking to get out of the property so if you are looking to keep this property potentially use it to pay for your child's university you know in five to ten years time then look for a nice stable market where you get a good quality tenant you know somebody who's highly likely to pay their rent on time every month you're going to see a nice rent increase because it's in a good city where wages are growing. Um, yeah, so I think that to give you an idea of different locations and why, um, there's many different places in the UK, you know, even short term rentals, commercial tenants, retail tenants. Um, this, these are all considerations that will drive you to different parts of the UK um, and different types of yields. Yeah. So just, uh, just, uh, I just want to elaborate just a little bit more on that because obviously there's been quite a shift to the northern part of the UK. There seems to have demand has picked up. And, 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 and do, you, do you want to maybe just share, I know it's a little bit off script now, but in terms of the, the, the area, because I think it's quite important in terms of what you've just said, yeah, um, the north has now become far more popular and obviously far more affordable. Do you, do you want to maybe yeah. share a little bit about yeah. Yeah, sure. So um, th there's definitely been a move of investment to the north and specifically, Neil, because of the affordability um, with the growing demand for housing. We have yeah. Birmingham has become a financial district, you know, but second tier to London um, and Manchester. Well, well Manchester has become, I, I would say, almost a competitor for London at the moment. It's it's a beautiful city. It's got some of your top restaurants and um, very popular with, you know, wealthy, well-known footballers. Um, you know, UK celebrities tend to live in the north um, of the country. And there's, there's, a, there's a demand or growing demand for housing there due to workforce being able to move to the north for many reasons. They can have now a better property. Um, for, for less money. So you're probably looking at, you know, starting prices of £150,000 in the north, whereas you wouldn't get anything near that in in London and surrounds um, for £150,000. But essentially, your rental yields are also growing. You know, the the, the fundamentals of, of finding rental yields is, is finding good quality tenants who are probably trying to get onto the property market, but haven't quite saved up enough money. 
um, to enter the property market. So they need to rent from you, landlord, for the three to five years um, while they work up in their job. That's the perfect tenant, right, in any city. Um, and you'll find that in the north. It's a much younger demographic um, working towards maybe buying their own property, which will start to drive your owner-occupier demand in the north. So um, it's it's almost two different property markets. London, you know, this this highly qualified um, market, and then the north, this sort of up-and-coming, booming market, um, which, you know, highly likely will lead – towards a, a very, very popular, growing, um, high asset value market in the next sort of 10 to 15 years as the regeneration schemes take effect, as transport um, is improved upon, which gives your accessibility between the North and London, you know, joining offices, joining workforces. This is all very important in the growth. Excellent. Richard, I know you want to add to that, but also I want to—I know you want to do some comparisons, you know, versus mm -hmm. other markets you play, because obviously you play in quite a number of countries, so you can actually see where the good returns are. Do you want to maybe just share a little bit on that? Yeah, well, I think I think just a point on the the entry level price um, to get into offshore property in the UK, you know, sets it apart from a lot of other jurisdictions. So you can get in for just over probably one hundred twenty thousand pounds, one hundred fifty thousand pounds. Um, you know, call it close to 3 million rand as an offshore asset that can yield pretty decent results, give you some capital growth and give you some rand hedge. Um, that's really, you know, as a, as, a, as a price point for South Africans to get offshore, that's probably the best entry level option um, for that. If you look at our other areas, um, such as uh, uh, Mauritius, as an example, um, there you're closer to entry level $200,000, probably 170 or 1,000 pounds. Um, but realistically, you uh, for for something decent, you're closer to the three hundred thousand um, dollars. You know, Switzerland obviously much higher price point. You're closer to five hundred thousand pounds for a uh, one bed or studio in Switzerland. Um, so, for our clients that are looking to just take the leap and get some of their portfolio offshore, the UK is really a great starting point. Okay, excellent, great stuff. Um, so let, let's delve into a little bit more into the whole process. And, you know, I'm going to say to the audience out there, please, you know, don't be shy, ask questions. We'll deal with all your questions at the end. And uh, so, so we will go into uh, a discussion point. So that's, if you've got specific questions, don't be shy, pop, pop it into the Q&A box and we will deal with it at the end. So let's just go into financial requirements, uh, Megan. Um, maybe tell us a little bit, what yeah. are the key financial requirements and how much investor capital is needed to start investing in the UK? Um, so, yeah, it's, it's fairly straightforward, but I'm going to speak um, you know, very broadly now. Obviously, it's, it's truly very specific to each individual, but you would need, if, you, if you're in South Africa or Africa and you're looking to um, invest into property in another country, the first thing you need to look at is restriction on foreign investment. In the UK, there is no restriction on foreign investment, so they welcome money and investors from anywhere in the world. Your country will not restrict you from, from investing. It will be based on, on the country in which you're investing to decide whether or not you're welcome to buy property there. So UK, no problem. Anyone can purchase. Then you would need to look at your ability to move money out of the country exchange controls. Now, based on um, investing into the UK, you can take out a mortgage in the country to purchase a property, but you would be able, you would need to be able to firstly open a bank account in that country because in order to get a mortgage in a country, you need a bank account, and you would be able to move enough funds overseas to meet all your obligations. That is a deposit on the property, a tax, which is like a stamp duty, um, or, or in this country, a transfer duty, and legal costs and other associated costs, maybe furniture, so on. So you'd need to be able to move that. That is usually in the UK, 25% of the purchase price is your deposit. And sometimes, depending on the property, of course, you can get up to 75% loan on it. And then I would add further roughly 10% in transaction costs on top of that. Um, so you'd need about 35% of the purchase price um, in order to, to enter. Now, as we mentioned earlier, entry-level price points actually start at about £120,000. 
Um, and so therefore you'd need roughly about 35 to 45,000 pounds um, ready to start that investment journey. Now, before you invest into a property, we would suggest you speak to somebody about whether or not you would qualify for a loan in the country, because that's obviously very important um, when buying a property so you don't lose any money in the process. I think so that gives you a broad understanding. <laughs> no, 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 sure. So, yeah. so I mean, let, let's just unpack the, 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 the mortgage a bit more because, you know, a lot of people yeah. want to get finance. You know, these, obviously you mentioned the 25% down, um, you know, the application. Let's unpack it. And obviously the big elephant in the room globally at the moment is interest rates. And, you know, yeah. And, so maybe just, just unpack where's that going? I mean, how does that yeah. impact sort of investors in, 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 in that process? And uh, so maybe just, just, just delve a little bit more deeper into that. Sure. Um, so, I mean, UK mortgages are, it's, it's, a, it's a business in itself, to be honest with you. Um, it's unlikely that you'll go and get a um, a mortgage in the UK from, from a bank or from a high street bank. It's going to be a private lender or an institutional lender. Um, in the past, these have been pension funds. Now they're open to, you know, all sorts of firms are offering the ability to lend against property because of the security of UK property and the highly likelihood that tenants will um, honour obligations which is their rental payments, makes this a very safe space for firms to open a business in. And that business is loaning money with um, an associated interest rate. Now, obviously, your Bank of England interest rates will drive what those interest rates look like. But because the sector is, for all intents and purposes, a private sector, you'll often find that if your Bank of, interest, uh, Bank of England interest rate is, say, 5%, which it is at the moment, they've just come down 0.25 five basis points, you'll have a private lender who's willing to lend you money almost around 5.8%. So that's 0.8% above your, your National Bank of England rates. So great. I mean, lending in the UK is, is readily available, provided you can meet the minimum requirements. That's not to say it's easy. It's, it's quite a grueling process, warning in advance, um, <laughs> but absolutely worth it because your cost of capital as an investor is, can be as little as 1% to 2%, you know, say 0.8, but it could be 1% to 2% above what the Bank of England interest rate is. So all of a sudden, you're borrowing money based on, you know, a very low, a low base, plus a little bit, and and your and often your yields can exceed that. So why the investment modeling works is because the cost of capital is low, especially when you come from South Africa, where you know we, we used to double di digit, double digits in in um, lending interest rates. So looks very attractive, and then your yields and your growth for the first most part, your yields are fairly secure because tenants. It's, it's a very low delinquency rate of, of no uh, no rental payments in the UK. Very, very secure market. We can come on to that a bit later. Um, but also, yeah, you can meet your obligations. You get property price growth due to high demand. And due to rental demand, you get growing rental returns on an annual basis. So all in all, the, the, the meeting of this lending, the, the security of buying property and the tenants meet their demands makes mortgaging the property more available. Excellent. Richard, did you want to add some more bits to that? Yeah, just a point on on the mortgage for South Africans. So since the grey listing of South Africa, or, or we're on the grey list or the black list, I'm not sure which one, but... Um, grey list. <laughs> grey list, okay. So, so you know, we need to get off the grey list um, from for a number of reasons, but that has made it more complicated for South Africans to gear and mortgage offshore. So the, 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 the compliance... Um, requirements for South Africans has become a lot more onerous. Um, and, and that's why, I mean, at Sable, we've actually got a, a mortgage broker in-house uh, based in our head office in London. Um, and, um, you know, it's part of, of, of Megan's job with the team there is to help South Africans be able to secure the best rates possible and take them through that admin process that, you know, needs a little bit of attention from the clients. But um, that's exactly what we do um, and how we help the clients through the process. Excellent. Yeah, exactly. We've got an in-house mortgage team who will drive this, and administrators, um, who will see to see to the management of an, a mortgage application, 
Um, but saying that, you know, we, we've got expertise in-house as well because we've got to submit certain documents around what property you're purchasing. Because at the end of the day, the lenders are not actually lending to the individual. They, they might be looking at the fun, at the financials of an individual, but what they're lending on is the property and the likelihood of a tenant to rent that property and meet those obligations. So the property itself is what matters, and therefore what's the most important thing is that you buy a property that does meet the requirements of a lender, and therefore I think that's where we bring in a lot of um, a lot of expertise as a company. Excellent. Good. So let's talk a little bit about tenant demand. Um, so, so which factors should South African investors consider to identify high demand rental areas? And particularly, let's focus on regeneration, infrastructure developments, job growth perspective, because all the fundamentals of tenants and that kind of thing. So I think in the UK... The how to how to pitch it is it's actually it's quite simple. If you think about tenants, what what's the likelihood of a good tenant? A good tenant is somebody who's probably looking to enter the property market themselves. So it's highly likely they've they've got a career in mind. They've got they've got some in a lose. I think that's how I always when I speak to our clients, I'm like. Try get a tenant who wants to go onto the property market, who who has highly likely to meet their obligations now because in future they want to be a landlord themselves. In the UK, most of the time you'll get a good quality tenant. Um, a huge percentage of the population is tertiary educated. That's not to suggest that that those are the people who meet their demands, but the chances are they've they've committed themselves to further study, they've committed themselves to a career, and they now need to keep. Their, their financial record clean so that they can move on to buy a property in the future. So that is a really, really big part of being a landlord is getting the best possible tenant that's not going to give you a headache, you know, ideally can change their own light bulb, but can absolutely pay their rent on a monthly basis. Um, so that's very important. Then you can move into what property management looks like. Property management is, is is obviously the job of an individual who understands how to maybe fix something or appoint a contractor, but it's also what property you give them, So, with, which is why we often will suggest new build property or newly refurbished property, because as a landlord, you want the least unknown costs in the period of ownership as possible, and often a new build property will give you at least five to seven years of very little headache, um, and therefore you've got a happy tenant because they're enjoying living in a property that doesn't give them trouble as well. So um, it, it's it's quite a simple, um, it's simple understanding of, of of tenant fees, fees landlord and management. But I think it's often to try and keep it as simple as possible. Um, obviously, we've got many um, different types of tenancy terms. So you've got short term. Uh, in fact, this next slide will, will give you um, a better idea. But short-term accommodation, long-term rental, commercial tenants, retail tenants, hotel, student, and council tenancies. Each of these come with their own set of circumstances, management, and tenancy type. Um, but your, your most common is just straightforward long-term rental. But it can also mean a slightly lower yield than you might find in short-term accommodation, commercial, retail, hotel, student, and council. Okay, excellent. Okay, so let's just talk a, a little bit more about uh, property management because, you know, a lot of the investors, if they're not in the UK, it's uh, they need somebody else to look after their property. Um, can investors uh, deal with you yes. in terms of finding a trustworthy property management team to handle the investments yeah. remotely? Yeah. yeah, actually, Neil, great question. Thank you. Um, to be honest with you, when you come to a firm like us to buy property, it absolutely doesn't end there. Um, our part of the packaging of the investment, because, you know, whilst bricks and mortar, this is still an investment which will form part of your portfolio, um, is, is to give you a long-term management solution, if not more than one to choose from. Um, so most of the time, we'll try to have a tenancy secured um, about 10 days from completion of the property. So you won't have to wait very long before you've got a contract in front of you 
um, you know, for, for whichever type of tenancy. And in some instances, we'll actually secure the tenancy um, and the management between, you know, offer and, um, and taking ownership of the property. Um, and that will be with a managing agent, with a tenant and with an agreement and contract um, to do with all or fixtures fittings, so whether or not you have to furnish it, if they're going to furnish it, and how or who pays for ongoing management issues in the property, because that can vary depending on what type of tenancy you have. For instance, a commercial tenancy will often be that the tenant pays all management costs, all re refurbish fit out for their shop or whatever they, they're running um, in the premise, um, whereas if it's long term, the landlord will have to take on all costs. And sometimes in the case of a short-term tenancy, you can actually rent it to an operator who will take on all associated management costs during the time. So absolutely, Neil, um, depending on the type of activity that's occurring in the premises, we will have a company um, and a contract in place to ensure that the, the smooth of transition and the ongoing management. Okay, excellent. So let's talk about the cash flows. What are the best practices you've seen, probably with some of your clients? How, how are they managing cash flow, mortgage payments, rental collections? Uh, yes. And, you know, how they're estimating it currently? I mean, is there, do you assist with that as well? Yeah. So, obviously, so we'll actually provide a, um, a spreadsheet cash flow at the beginning, um, which will give you an idea of your initial costs, which is relating to what I mentioned earlier with 25 to 35% probably about 35%. Um, best practice I've always suggested is have three months worth of payments due in the account, um, in your UK account in order to meet your obligations. Um, there are some nuances. Sometimes that money has got to come from outside of the UK, but we can go into that again, why you'd come to, to work with us. Um, but, you know, make sure you have three months of running costs for any property. You know, don't let it bleed you dry on purchase, please, um, mm -hmm. because things can happen. Tenants can be delayed on moving. Um, you know, there's many reasons, but one reason is you need to ensure that you're meeting your obligations because you don't want any issues with a bank, you know, coming knocking or a, or a lender. Um, so, yeah, so I think three months worth of uh, running costs will also cover any unforeseen maintenance costs, um, you know, even furniture, um, anything that you might need to do in order to get the tenancy up and running. Once the tenancy is up and running, um, as I say, your, your tenant will begin to pay will begin to pay rent to your property manager. Um, I know you're going to come into tax later on, so we'll explain how that structure works. But um, yes, from a from a best practice, it is is, is to keep to keep some money aside. Um, and also, if you're given the choice between doing an interest-only and a capital repayment mortgage, it is our suggestion to do an interest-only mortgage because especially when you're not in country and we are somewhere where there is exchange control in effect, having your obligations lower, low as possible is beneficial um, because that means that for any reason, you have to make X amount, but you don't have to make X plus 10. Um, and if you do have extra money and you manage to move it over to the UK, you can always make an overpayment on your mortgage. It's better to make a, a volunteered overpayment than to have an obligation that you can't meet. So I think those two things are probably major considerations for an investor. Extra cash flow and try and keep your obligatory payments as low as possible. You want to just unpack the, the interest only versus non interest only mortgages. I know it's not too popular in South Africa and it's very popular in the UK, also in the US, yes. and kind of those markets. So maybe just some. Yeah. Um, so I think it would be, yeah, it's, it's good to mention why there's interest only and, and capital repayments. So in South Africa, we only repay our mortgages, but we do have an access bond. Um, in the UK, you don't really have an access bond. So an interest-only payment is to meet the interest on the loan amount. And it never actually repays the loan. It repays the interest. I think historically, the reason they've offered this is because the UK is such a strong market that more than likely you're going to see growth on the asset anyway. So the bank feels confident, or the lender, sorry, I keep saying bank, but it's um, more of an understanding term. Um, the lender feels confident 
in the fact that the property price will grow. So even if you just pay the interest on the minimum investment amount, there's enough in that purchase should anything happen. So they're confident in you just in, in you servicing the loan and and you can sort of remain confident that your property price will grow. So your equity still grows um, on that asset. Most South African buyers will pay down that loan because the idea of having debt in the UK is, is daunting for us all. Um, but so they will try to pay down that loan. Sometimes an interest only mortgage as well can can provide you with a nice um, income versus um, interest cost, which which leaves you with, say, um, some an amount between your rent and your interest, which you can then begin to save if you are looking to build a bigger portfolio. So essentially, it just keeps your cost center down. You're welcome to make repayments, but you don't have to. And for me, that's, um, that's, a, that's a sign of a strong market when they're not trying to get rid of debt. They're happy to hold debt um, in property because of the fundamentals. Okay, cool. There's, there's, there's uh, Erica, she's asked a double-edged question here because, and I think it's, it's right to probably deal with it right now as opposed to dealing it right at the sure. end. Um, can I just ask you just to stop your share there, uh, uh, Megan? Yes. Just so that Because everybody wants to see you. <laughs> so let's just talk about Erica Patel's asked a very pertinent question and she said when does the capital need to be repaid on the interest Sorry. on the mortgage um, uh, just a sec you, you fine we can see Got it. now the, the yeah yeah sorry my screen um, froze no, no you're doing well you're doing well on this side at least it's, there's no problem yeah so when does the capital need to be repaid on the interest only mortgage or how long is the mortgage term just elaborating yeah. on this on this on the whole mortgage issue now sure um so the mortgage term it's essentially until you retire um so if you are you know mid 30s mid 40s retirement age well actually you can borrow in the UK until you're 83 believe it or not and um, again speaks to <laughs> the robust nature of the market wow um so you could take 30 years 35 years 25 years. Essentially, the mortgage needs to be paid at the end of that term, um, or you could remortgage. So at the end of that term, you you go to another lender, the same lender, and and take out another long term um, rental. What happens is the lender will send out a valuer to the property to give you a valuation, to give them a valuation of the property. That valuer is what you call a RICS qualified valuer. So they have. Um, they're actually very qualified with with six or more years of study um, into UK property. And then they can say to the bank, we see this property is worth 400,000. So we're very happy for you to lend them 300,000 on the property. That 300,000 will then carry for 25 years. If you want to remortgage it at that point, they'll send out a valuer again. Right. We believe the property to be worth a million pounds now. So we're happy to lend that 300,000 back to the owner again. Um, so it's it's kind of it, it could carry on forever, um, but essentially it needs to be paid at the end of the loan term, and the loan term is agreed at the time of the loan. Okay, so lots of flexibility. That, I think that's the key: is that yeah. there's uh, lots of flexibility and lots of options that you can do. So, which is great, Richard. You can leave your cam on because I know you disappear every now and again, and I know Megan is doing such a great job here. Uh, but I want to bring you in as well. So just uh, just maybe just add to to the whole UK, just from your experience and dealing with clients and that kind of stuff. And also versus, you know, the other countries that you've been dealing in terms of, because now somebody's going into a new jurisdiction, maybe for the first time, some people are doing it for second, third, fourth, fifth times. <laughs> so maybe just add to to the conversation. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, just touching on, on Megan on, on the conversation now with the interest rates, you know, we're starting to see the interest rates decline in the UK. Um, you know, I don't think it'll be at levels um, that there were, you know, pre pandemic, um, or post pandemic, but um, ultimately, it's on a declining trend, which is obviously good from a from a loan point of view. Um, as South Africans, I think we inherently want to pay off capital. Um, but the UK is quite a different market in order to be able to run an interest only loan um, where the value of the yeah. of the real estate is, is exceptionally stable and continues you know on the growth path yeah. 
probably at a lower rate slightly percentage wise, but pretty stable over 25 years. Um, yeah. so, so that's important. I think just from a um, buying offshore and jurisdiction point of view, um, if I look at our team here at Sable, you know, between um, you know, Megan, myself and the rest of the team, by and large, most of us have been through the process of buying property offshore. And it's important that um, as sort of specialists in this industry, we can help clients through our own experience. Um, so that's sort of an important point. Going into a foreign jurisdiction is uh, every country is different. So if you look at how Greece runs, you look at how the UK runs, you look at how Mauritius runs, um, they all run very differently. And the requirements, whether you can loan or not, whether you can buy as an individual or in a company or in a structure, all of those things that are important um, from a planning point of view for our clients, um, they're all different. So it's important to, to bear that in mind um, as you know our clients look to sort of externalize funds and invest offshore. Excellent. Yeah. So maybe uh, on that back to point you. of yes, interest no, rates, on. actually, I just thought, <laughs> um, you know, I think, Richard, you make a good point there because holding debt in a 5% interest rate um, is, is, is quite nice. As South Africans, we can't hold debt um, with that low cost of capital here. So, you know, to keep debt in the UK and start to save up your wealth, you know, in a, in a place where maybe you've got better interest rates on, your, on the plus side, um, but also... In the UK, with moving interest rates, what's important to understand is a lot of the time you can take out a tracker rate. So you don't have to fix your interest rate, although you can if you want to, um, but you can have sort of your interest rate moves with the Bank of England. So really, your cost of capital is the 2% plus the Bank of England, Bank of England rate, and we envisage that's going to come down. Um, they're working towards it. I know the goal of the Bank of England at the moment is to have it, it down quite a few more basis points by um, the end of next year. Um, so, you know, they need to incentivize purchasing in the UK. And um, I remember a very important time at the beginning of COVID when people got a little bit afraid of purchasing property offshore. The government in the UK one of their main objections is to always incentivize property purchase to keep that market moving. It's, it's one of the reasons the country is such a powerhouse because of such a, a huge amount of foreign investment into the property market. So the first thing they did was cut buying tax for six months in the start of COVID, which meant people who were going to be locked down in a two-bed flat with five children could suddenly go and buy the family home that they had intended to and not pay transfer tax on it. Um, so it, it really incentivized moving around and, you know, maybe not the best thing to do, but nonetheless, people could move properties and you were unrestricted in order to do that. So a government with that much care for their property market is a property market you probably want to have a stake in. Okay, wonderful. So, uh, very important point. I think, you know, it sounds that, uh, you know, you talk 5%, uh, you know, versus where we just did, what, 11, just the 11, I think 11.75, and we're hoping that it's going to come down next month. In fact, the UK was the first country to actually drop their interest rate. So, I think they've started that trend, and we're looking now at the US, and uh, they're sitting next month, and obviously, it was in South Africa. So, we're hoping it's, you know, it's a lot of more easing on that one so let's just let's just talk more about the tax okay because this is important and also ownership structures because i don't think you could talk about tax with not talking about ownership structures sort of hand in yeah. hand it's sort of i'm just going to share again because it, no these problem are of course things, please do. I, I, i'll show you on the screen <laughs> sorry um share. no problem um and then we'll just come back i think if we can to uh yeah. oh sorry to a few properties that I, I put up here because I think it's always nice for everyone to see um, those. Uh, one sec. Okay, so go. so tax and buying structures. Um, we need to consult a tax specialist um, and, so, and an accountant um, for, for the buying structures. So they aren't with us today. Obviously, I know a little bit about this, but it's, it's very specific to your personal needs. So firstly, what affects your tax and buying structure? Who can buy? Um, as I mentioned earlier in the UK, no restriction on foreign investment. Um, Non-landlord, non-resident landlord scheme. Now, what this is, is when buying a property in the UK, you will have to pay a tax on that income. 
that income will have a withholding tax directly with your agent unless you can show that you have registered for tax and that you will do your own tax return on an annual basis. That means registering with the HMRC. It's not simple, but it's absolutely doable and we can do it. Um, when you, and, and obviously then you will be tax compliant. In order to be tax compliant, you will have to submit an annual tax return. It's done online. It's super simple. Um, but you also get a tax allowance in the UK of £12,500 on your rental income. That is a tax-free amount of money. Anyone buying a property at an entry-level price point in the UK will not have to then pay tax in the UK because it's unlikely the income will exceed a thousand pounds a month. Um, so twelve and a half thousand pounds a year. So you can rest easy that it's not um, you know, it's not it's not a, a deep pit of taxes in the UK. They're generous to landlords who are making an entry level investment. Um, buying property and using a limited company, um, again, possible, um, but there are some considerations to make. How big is the portfolio that you're choosing to set up? Because these things cost money. These structures, cost, they can really cost a lot of money depending on how intricate um, it's going to be, whether it's offshore, where is there a trust holding a company, et cetera. Um, and then you've got to think about having, you need a UK-based director. So somebody needs to be appointed as a director. That's obviously then a paid role. Um, so can add to your cost center and you'll need a bank account in the UK in a company name, which will then in turn affect your mortgage. The mortgage would then need to be offered in the company name. So it's doable, but this, this conversation is, is um, yeah, it, it's something that requires a little bit more understanding of one's individual circumstances. Um, and then rental income and taxes there's a tax for a limited company and then individual ownership. Often our advice is to buy in your own name if your portfolio is below two million pounds. So for the most part, individuals should just considering buy, buying in their own name. If you intend for this to be a generational asset, then you can put it into multiple names, um, which will affect your um, inheritance tax objectives. Inheritance tax is anything over £325,000 per person. So if you're a couple and you're looking at buying a property for three to £400,000, you don't have to consider your inheritance tax objectives yet um, or obligations. Um, so, so, you know, just to consider own name versus that. And you can put up to four names on a title deed. So four people in a family, which will spread your risk of your tax um, obligations per year, you get twelve and a half thousand pounds per person allowance, and you get three hundred and twenty five thousand pounds per person for inheritance tax. Um, and of course, this then affects the whole broader picture. Um, so I think just to yeah, just to give an idea for now on, on how that works, but please come to us individually um, yeah, to discuss your structure. Excellent, great stuff. Thanks, thanks for that, Megan. Uh, can sure. you just close off just your your presentation again, if you don't mind? Um, yeah. We get to our last one. I know you want to talk about. There is one more thing. Maybe you can leave that slide up because I know Richard, you can come back as well. And because uh, and and I think it's, it's 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 quite an important one, which it doesn't matter where you invest. I know you also want to show some properties as well. Yeah. Megan, I'm going to give you that opportunity. Just okay. before you get there, um, and it's 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 more of a general question, and you know, how should South African investors handle preparing for and adapting to potential future changes? Now, you know, obviously, UK highly regularized uh, environment, you know, like South Africa, like anywhere, you know, so it's, it's different. So, and we find that you know, tax laws change, everything change, regulations change, and all that kind of stuff. So how do you, do you normally deal with it in terms of if there's been a significant change of some sort? Uh, is there restructure? Is there, you know, that kind of stuff? Maybe let's just have a debate yeah. about it, Richard. I think I'll bring you in it. Uh, Megan, you're welcome to comment as well, both ways. Go for it. Richard. Yeah, I mean, from the tax perspective and the ownership structures, um, the, you know, with Sable having a head office in the UK and in Cape Town, ultimately both... Um, offices have the tax um, specialization in-house. So 
we can advise from the South African tax perspective and from the UK tax perspective. And it's critical that clients obviously abide by both tax laws um, based on where the investment is, i.e. the UK, and that they don't fall foul of the South African uh, revenue service. Um, you know, as, as you know, Neil, all these things are, are more and more interconnected um, from a technology point of view. And it's important that the client understands the tax implications and that we guide the client to make the, the, the right decisions from a tax um, and a structure point of view. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so uh, Megan, you're welcome to uh, that, but I know you want to show some properties because the time is running out. So let's probably yeah. start looking at those properties and unpacking the markets and having a look what's available. So yeah, exactly. Uh, look, these aren't available properties. They are. I just want to show some examples. We, we've spoken yeah. about things holistically. Um, I, I personally like to see things visually, and I'm sure others would too. Um, so just to give you an example of, of some properties. So we're in Bolton now. Bolton's in the north. It's, it's basically part of Greater Manchester. Um, this was a six-unit property okay, so which we we can't see your screen there um, again just try again uh, just reset. oh sorry one sec yeah yeah um oh, oh there we go got it yes okay now we can now we oh can. good Perfect. um okay there we go so this was a six unit um property in uh, greater manchester um one individual bought the whole thing um, hundred thousand per unit, uh, so six hundred thousand for the for the total investment. Um, how we selected this is it's just beside a travel lodge. Um, we wanted we running this as a hotel, so we've appointed a management company on the client's behalf, and um, a, and and that's fully running without a huge amount of input from him or them. Um, it's right, right in the center of Bolton, right beside a travel, travel lodge, which suggests that it would have a good short-term rental demand. Now, short-term rental figures on this have been very good. It was completely renovated, bought, furnished, um, and uh, a management company has come in. So they, they do turnovers from one night to a week and sometimes a couple of months. Bolton itself hasn't got a lot of high-end property because it's in its early days of development. But like other parts of the north, the area will be redeveloped. It's not far from Manchester. Um, it's, got a, it's got a community coming through that are doing actually regeneration work. So you get a lot of contractors, engineers staying here. So it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, actually. Um, but they're doing work in the town and therefore it's driving demand in the short term. So in the short term, the client will operate this as a hotel um, and yields will be probably in excess of 8%, but I, I should think in double digits um, in, in net figures. So that's after all the, the, the client's costs, including council tax, water, electricity, Wi-Fi, um, and management costs associated, which of course are higher when you run a short let. So this is a great example of entry-level price point apartments, 100,000 um, each, which are being operated as a short let. They're in good condition, so they absolutely can be used as a short let with, with minimal issues. They're still under developer warranty as well. Um, and I think, you know, as an area itself, it's up and coming. So capital growth with such a central location. And in the long run, when you know, you're tired of using it as a short let and, and Bolton itself has become a little bit more of a booming market, get really nice rental returns on the long term. So that's one example. Another example, and I'm showing very entry level um, property here, but you know we we can we can do anything. We we also um, sell multi unit buildings at, at five to ten million. So um, you know up to the client. But here we've got the, this is an old mill that's been refurbished um, in an area called Halifax, which is also in the north. Um, starting price points one hundred and twenty thousand. Here short term and long-term rental, there's a, there's a demand for both. How we find the demand out for short-term rental is we, we use sites. We use sites like Airbnb, Booking.com, Hotels.com. All the major short-term operators provide us with statistics based on areas as to average room night, 
occupancy. So this is not thumb suck data, it's real data. And we can then work out a projection for our clients yields and the performance of that property investment over time. And last but not least, um, this is this is a nice, interesting investment. Again, a bit like that first building, six one bedrooms inside of a building. Um, also a short let operated um, property, but the client didn't want to manage it themselves. So we rented it out to a middle operator. Now that operator takes on all management costs, monthly running costs. The client is paid for five years on a net um, a figure per month with absolutely no costs going to them whatsoever um, except insurance per year, which is actually relatively low in the UK. So here, this property was £330,000 and the client gets 30000 per year. That operator then rents these properties out on a short term. This is Blackpool, very, very popular holiday destination for, um, for the Brits living in the north, um, in the north of, of the country. It's got two piers, um, you know, candy floss, um, or, you know, where you would take your children for a weekend in the UK or a week's break, beach, etc. cetera. Um, so it's you know, very popular and therefore this client is, is um, capitalizing on, on short-term rental yields and nightly stays run by an independent operator and it's very, very low hassle investment. Excellent. Good. Yeah. Thanks, so thanks I will stop for... sharing. No, excellent. No, good. I think, uh, I don't know where the time's gone. We're already almost by the bewitching hour. Um, the questions I see that came through very much seem to be seeking your services, uh, Megan and Richard. You can see clearly they need some more guidance with the mortgage. Um, they need to understand the process and that kind of thing. So obviously anybody that does have any sort of uh, questions, I encourage you to please reach out to, to Megan and to Richard uh, directly, or even, you know, just to, to us uh, back on this channel at uh, REI. Um, uh, there's a, there is a question here from Linda, um, and she says, do you ever get properties on your books in the Earlsfield, Wimbledon area, or only in the north? And probably a question for you, Megan. Yeah, sure. Um, so there's a, there's a two-faceted approach here. Um, if one is looking for an investment property, then best to come chat to us and we'll show you the different types of investment properties that we've discovered. If you're looking to purchase a property in England and you've got a very specific set of requirements because perhaps it's for you, your children are going to live in it, and you're going to use it in the long run, or just more specifically, you want a property in a certain area and that's that, you might tenant it, you know, so be it. But I think... In that case, it's a specific buying service. So what we have besides our investment property guidance is a buying service. And we've got a team based in the UK who will source property, negotiate the, on, the, on the purchase price on your, on, on, uh, your behalf based on an analysis on purchase prices, which we'll do. And that's basically a valuation, like a RICS, a RICS valuation. We will also um, appoint a surveyor and any other checks required in the property based on the knowledge of our team. And we will manage it for you afterwards if you need that. So both, we do both. We can, we can source property anywhere in the UK based on, on your um, requirements. Wonderful. And Bram has just asked, do you deal with both freehold and leasehold? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Everything. Okay. Yeah. Right across. Yeah, because you're quite diverse. Yeah. Says, Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> and, and I'll just say, don't, don't worry too much about leasehold um, at, versus freehold. Owning the freehold is generally when you, you obviously own the land at the at the bottom, but a leasehold is, is is actually a governing set of rules, which means that if there's multiple owners in a building, you almost want some sort of contract. Um, but also recently they've abolished ground rent which is what you used to have to pay on a leasehold. So now it's considered peppercorn rent. So actually you're supposed to go and deliver a peppercorn every year to your um, your leaseholder, but I mean, that's just ridiculous. Um, so don't worry too much if it's a long lease, if it's a lease under 100 years, specifically under 70 years, 
it will affect your ability to get lending on a property. So a short lease, unfortunately, is probably a no-go as an investor, but a nice long lease is much the same as a freehold. Excellent. I, I think it's a good, good uh, point there, uh, Megan, because if I was the investor, I'd focus on the cash flow. I wouldn't worry about the leasehold or the freehold. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, well, it, it depends. Again. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure. Good. Guys, can't believe it. We've come to the end. And what I'm going to do is just ask each one of you just to give you a one minute wrap, uh, starting with you, Richard, you know, your final thoughts that you could leave the audience uh, before they go. And uh, they're still on, believe it or not, they haven't all left us yet. So they're hanging on. So your final words, your final wrap, your one minute, and then I'm going to ask for you, Megan, and then we'll bid you all farewell. But uh, over to you, Richard. Okay, um, so Megan and I are off to the UK next week, I'm going to tie down the new sort of investment options for probably the next eight to 12 months, plus minus. Uh, so if anybody's got any particular requirements, um, uh, good time to pop uh, Megan a note. Um, and if there's anything in particular that they would like us to consider or look at, very happy to do so. Um, so that's yeah, I'll be flying Sunday. Um, but yeah, I think all in all, just as a closing, you know, the UK continues to be a strong market, a stable market. Uh, you know, we see the long term play with the uh, supply and demand of housing. The demand still outstripping the supply, um, and as a fundamental, that's an important um, growth point going forward. Excellent, great stuff. That's Richard Haller. He's the managing director of Sable International, and Megan. You can end up with your final. Oh, <laughs> I think everyone's heard enough from me. But <laughs> um, yeah, we are off to the UK next week. Um, and I'll let you know what property Richard buys. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Great stuff then. That's uh, Megan Copley. She's the sales director of Sable International. Thank you both. I think it's been wonderful. I just want to remind our audience of our next webinar. We've got two next week on Tuesday and Thursday. So please join us 12 o'clock. And to register, you just click on the links below. Just go to the rei.co.za website. To our audience, yes, we really appreciate your active participation, your engagement. Thank you for all your questions. As I mentioned, please, I encourage you all to reach out to, to us. You can go to info at rei.co.za or to any one of our panelists directly. Um, so you are, are welcome to do that. And uh, so, yes, until next time, I just want to thank our panelists again. It's really great having. I think that's great. It's, it's, Great, insightful discussion, and I think I look forward to to looking at other uh, areas, you know, Greece and uh, that kind of stuff. But let's focus on the UK right now, and I think we, we'd like to hear what you've come back with as well in terms of uh, those investments. So until next time, uh, stay informed, stay proactive. May your ventures in real estate uh, be continually fruitful and fulfilling, and take care and goodbye. Until next week, this is Neil Peterson of Real Estate Investor, along with Megan Copley and Richard Haller of Sable, um, signing out. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye, everybody. Cheerio.